Hey, my name is Rebecca. Welcome to my YouTube channel. Today I'm going to talk about 11 ways that yoga is good for you. I'm going to go in depth on some of the more abstract ways that yoga is good for you. And I'm going to categorize it in five categories. One, the physical. Two, the energetic. Three, the emotional. Four, the intellectual. And five, the spiritual. By the end of this video, you will be motivated to practice yoga on a regular basis. Okay, one, the physical. All right, I'm not gonna lie. I like the physical benefits that yoga brings to my body just on the looks part, okay? But there's a lot more to it that's beneath the surface. To be honest with you, I started practicing yoga because I was in a lot of pain. I had back problems. I had stress fractures in my low back because I was, um, well, I was a gymnast as in my youth and then a springboard diver in college. And I had fractures which just caused so much pain I could, that's a whole nother story. Anyway, long and short of it is, that's why I started yoga. And so many people get into yoga for so many different reasons. But let me just go through a quick list of what the physical benefits are. All right, one, it increases total body strength. And why is this? Because you're practicing the poses and you're putting your body in kind of um, interesting ways and holding it isometrically. And so when you do these poses, you're, you're calling on all the muscles in your body to hold them because there's some balance involved. And so by doing this, you're activating and strengthening, you know, stuff in your pinky toe when you think it's an abs workout, okay? So it works on all the muscles in the body. So you end up with this like total body super strength. I, I make jokes and I say that they're strong and then there's yoga strong because they're to, to, two totally different things. Two, yoga trims down on body fat. There's many reasons for this and it's not just because you're lifting weights and burning calories, it's different. Yoga works on the nervous system and so that helps to balance your metabolism. So it works on the endocrine system and the nervous system through the breathing practices and the poses put together. And that's what helps to trim down. And so what people find is instead of getting bulky muscular, you know, look, they get this trim and lean look that yoga brings. So that brings me to number three, leaning out. A lot of people find that they are able to get leaner when they practice yoga because yoga works on the slow twitch muscle fibers, okay? When you're lifting weights or doing sprints or doing the high intensity um, interval training, that kind of stuff, you're building the fast twitch muscle fibers. So the fast twitch muscle fibers are actually larger, they're thicker and bulkier than the slow twitch muscle fibers. That's like when you look at a marathon runner versus a sprinter, the thighs on the sprinter, right? The Olympians especially, they're huge, okay? And the marathon runners, they're trimmed down, they're lean because those are the slow twitch muscle fibers. So yoga works on the slow twitch muscle fibers which allows people to get leaner as they're getting stronger. Four, increased flexibility. Okay, this is just a byproduct of the practice. So many people think that they have to be flexible to do yoga or they're not flexible enough for yoga. But the truth is yoga is a practice and the flexibility is the byproduct of the practice. So you don't have to be flexible. If you can breathe and basically if you can breathe, then you can practice yoga. When you are holding a pose and you're putting the muscle in like 80% of its lengthened state, you know, as, almost as far as you can go and then you're holding it there, you are naturally elongating the muscle fibers. And so you're allowing the nerves to lengthen, they relax, release a little bit. Um, and there's a science behind that too. It allows you to lengthen the muscle so you develop flexibility. Plus it brings fluid into the joints, the synovial fluid gets flowing, the juices get flowing. And so the joints you know, start to increase in mobility. And so when the joints are more mobile and the muscles are starting to lengthen, naturally flexibility is a byproduct of the practice. Lowered blood pressure, okay? 
This is a surprising one for people, but as they start to use the breathing techniques with the poses, it's they start to relax the nervous system and the stress levels go down, so blood pressure goes down. When stress levels are up, the body naturally increases in muscle tension. The arterial walls are made of a material that's not just, it's a combination of muscle fiber and organ fibers. It's like a little bit of both. And so these will contract when the, bus, when the body is under chronic tension. As you start to reduce your stress levels, then the blood pressure also starts to lower. Also studies have shown that inversions can help with lowering blood pressure. There's a science behind that too. You should Google that, it's very interesting. Six, it eliminates back pain, right? That's why I got into it. So many people are steered in the direction of yoga from their doctors because yoga helps to balance the skeletal system. It helps to release and strengthen areas that typically had too much muscle tension or chronic contraction. And those are the things that trigger back spasms and back pain. So even if your back pain is like off the charts, just craziness, yoga will help. I would suggest finding a yoga therapist in your area that can work with you or finding a program online that works specifically with back pain. Back pain is usually caused by an imbalance in the structure and the muscles have to um, compensate for the imbalance. And it could be a pattern that we're holding, it could be congenital, it could have been brought on by an injury. But regardless, the repetitive movements on both sides of the body where you're elongating and strengthening and moving the joints and the muscles, it just brings balance back to the skeletal system and cures so many back problems. I say cures loosely, but I'm just saying it, it at least reduces the pain so that it's manageable. And once that happens, then you start to move forward in other activities that you enjoy. Life just gets better. You get stronger. Before you know it, you've forgotten all about your back problem. And finally, um, number seven on the physical benefits of yoga is boosted immunity. Okay, this one people don't see coming, but boosted immunity happens because as you're moving the body through these positions and twisting and you're inverting the head and the feet and all these different positions that you normally wouldn't put the body, you're moving lymph through the body. Your lymph system is what carries um, nutrition to the cells. And when you're moving old stagnant lymph through the body, you start to bring in fresh nutrition to the cells and you're moving things out of the body. It's almost like, it's like the combination of a workout and a massage all in one. And that, help, that alone helps to boost the immune system. All right, now moving to another big category, the energetic. This one is a little difficult to describe, but in general, yoga will boost your energy levels. Okay, so I'm gonna be honest, and for the first, uh, I don't know, 10 years of practicing yoga, maybe more, um, honestly, maybe 15 years, I really didn't even believe that there was like energy in the body. Like I'm a kind of, you got to see it to believe it kind of a person or experience it or feel it or something. And so for the longest time, I really didn't feel or experience or see anything that had to do with energy. So I just kind of went along with it. Let me break it down for you the way I understand it now. All right. So there are seven major energy centers in the body. You can't see them with your eyes. I mean, some people can, but most people cannot. But they are there, they've been measured. There's technology now that can measure the energy centers of the body. Just like you can measure um, brain impulses um, and things like that. And there are also five main energy currents in the body. Additionally, there are, yoga literature says that there's 72,000 channels of energy in the body. Okay, so we've got the chakras, right? We'll, we'll just stay, keep it simple and talk about the seven main chakras. So you have chakras, you have major flows of energy through the body, there's five of them. Those are called the pranavayus. And then you have the nadis, the channels of, of energy in the body. So you have quite a complex system of understanding the way energy moves in the body according to yoga. Okay, all that aside, let's just say for a minute, 
you have the ability to move energy through the body. I think we can all agree that we understand that the, that the brain sends electrical impulses to move the body, right? But we can't see them. We can all agree that there's Wi-Fi in the air because and, you, and cellular service, right? But we can't see it. We can all agree that there are definitely things that are, that are energetic that don't exist that we cannot see. However, when you practice, anybody can do this. If you practice long enough and tune into it, you can feel it. And it just takes someone to teach you what it is that you're feeling. You feel it all the time, you just don't know what it is that you're feeling. And once someone points it out to you, it's super simple and you can't really even unlearn it. It's like riding a bike. Let's be practical here. As you're practicing the poses and you're connecting the breath with the movement, while you're doing that, your attention and your awareness is going to different parts of the body because the movements are they're complex. These yoga poses are not easy. They look simple in a picture, but when you try to do it on a mat, it requires strength, coordination, focus, and then you have to, you know, get your breathing down. So when you're doing this, you're bringing awareness to different parts of the body. By doing that, you're moving energy, whether you want to call it chi or in yoga, we call it prana, whatever it is, you're moving it through the body with your intention and your breath and your movement. Let's back up a little bit. In yoga, anything, any pain or disease is typically caused by energy that's either blocked or stuck or not, you know, it's not flowing properly, an improper flow. So if you're taking your physical body and your awareness and your breath and you're moving in different directions with awareness, what are you doing? Obviously, you're pushing energy through. We know you're moving lymph through the body, okay? Imagine lymph was energy, okay? You're moving these, this stuff through the body and as you're doing that, you're clearing things out. That is in my opinion, why a lot of people feel reduced pain when they start practicing yoga. People with fibromyalgia find that, you know, practicing a gentle yoga practice really helps to reduce pain. I believe it's in part by because of moving energy. So energy is the first. In yoga, energy starts everything physical. So you need the energy in order to create the physical matter. So if you're taking energy and you're constantly clearing it and moving it, and you do this on a regular basis, weekly or daily or whatever, you start to feel an increased vitality. And so people instantly feel like they have more energy. And it's not necessarily has to do with food or calories or sleep or anything like that. It has to do with the actual moving of energy in the body. Not only, that's, that's like a whole kind of conversation in itself. So, once you start practicing yoga, then you start to feel good and you start to feel like you want to improve your food choices and your health habits as well. Not only that, but yoga helps you sleep better at night. So if you're doing something that's moving the energy through the body, you're getting better night's sleep, you're going to feel more energetic the next day. All right, here we are, number nine. But now we're getting into the third category. We talked about the physical, the energetic, and now we're going to get into the emotional. So the emotional benefits of yoga are that it helps you to develop resilience. Okay, we're all here having a human experience and nobody really escapes without having ups and downs in life. All right, so the ninth way that yoga is good for you. Um, we're, this takes us into the third major category, which is the emotional. And I think this is one that surprises some people. It helps to develop resilience. One of the things that I know is that it really helps most people with anxiety and it also helps with depression. It's estimated that over 285 million people on the planet suffer from anxiety. And it's estimated that over 265 million people on the planet suffer from depression. So how does yoga help with depression and anxiety? It helps by balancing the nervous system. Now this is, an, this is a tricky one. When you're doing the yoga poses and you're focused on the breath, this is the key right there because it helps kind of reset the nervous system. Most Americans are in a constant state of stress. So most people are in a chronic state of stress 
And when this happens, the nerve, the sympathetic nervous system is triggered. When the sympathetic nervous system is triggered, it means that the parasympathetic, which is the rest and digest, okay, so the sympathetic nervous system is the fight or flight, the parasympathetic is the rest and digest. You can only have one on at a time. They both don't work at the same time. It's like the gas pedal and the brakes. You, can, you have to have one or the other. If you're chronically in the sympathetic nervous system, that's when you start to develop all the stress-related illnesses and problems. Additionally, this is kind of where anxiety comes in. And in yoga, we say that anxiety is thinking about the future and depression is thinking about the past. And so yoga helps bring us in the present, okay? And that's the simple form. That's kind of the yoga metaphorical version. But on a physical level, when you have control of the breath, like you do in a yoga practice, I don't care what pose you're doing or if you're just sitting, breath alone is your connection to the nervous system. If you were to sit there and start to do rapid breathing, you would start to induce a state of panic or anxiety. If you sat there and reduce your breathing in a methodical, slow, controlled manner, you will start to feel relaxed. When you do this to the body while you're bringing movement, or even if you're just sitting, you start to in induce a state of relaxation so that you give the nervous system an opportunity to switch over to the parasympathetic. I think, you know, this is kind of a sidebar. If you can get the parasympathetic to kick back in when it's supposed to, that's your rest and digest. Now you've improved your sleep, you've improved your digestion, a whole host of things comes in there too. Your digestive tract has a whole lot of serotonin and serotonin is a hormone that makes you feel good. That is kind of you know the long route to it, but in general, it's based on the breath. Any breathing exercise that you can do that controls the breath, slows it down, will bring the nervous system into the parasympathetic is going to help with depression and anxiety. The other aspect of the emotions is that yoga, while you're on the yoga mat doing the practice, it often brings up emotions. And it's often a place where people explore emotions because it's yoga is an internal practice. And it's not through talk therapy or asking your friends or reading a book or anything like that. It's more about intuition and you start to feel things on a deeper level. When people start to understand this and start to get in touch with their emotions, it opens up a whole new level. My personal opinion is that your emotions are your navigation system for the body. Your body speaks to you through emotions. Your body has its own intelligence and its own intuition and it shares this with you. Your, your body is an instrument of perception. You are occupying the vehicle for the time being and if you can learn to read your emotions, well now you've got another navigation tool to add to your arsenal. In my opinion, understanding your emotions is like a superpower. It's not, you know, becoming wimpy and in touch with your emotions or anything like that. It's quite the opposite. If you start to actually know how you feel and know what's yours and what's someone else's, it's very powerful. And it also helps you to develop resilience to situations that might normally suck you in. When you start to understand yourself and, and perceive emotions and know what they are and how they function, it's a game changer. So you get this, you know, you get this resilience that comes with yoga. Unfortunately, most Americans are systematically taught to ignore their emotions. We're taught that we need to listen to our minds, our intellect, and to rationalize things. And so at a very young age, we're just kind of trained not to listen to. I personally think that not understanding your emotions is also a contributing factor to many of the health problems that Americans experience today. Because emotions are an energy, and a lot of the illnesses that we see today are energy problems. In you know, in my opinion, because it's energy first that creates the physical. And a lot of it stems from emotions and unresolved emotions, misunderstood emotions, things like that. I don't think understanding your emotions makes you weak or wimpy. I think that it's just the opposite. I think it gives you strength and resilience and it takes courage to be quite honest. If, you know, to sit down and deal with some, you know, something really ugly that you don't want to think about, 
it takes time, it takes courage, and it takes a willingness to want to change. Most people find that a lot of things just don't bother them anymore. All right, number 10, the intellectual. This is interesting. Clinical studies have shown that yoga raises your IQ. All right, it's not something that's set in stone. It is something that you can improve. All right, so deep breathing in these exercises helps to bring oxygen to the brain. And when you bring oxygen to the brain, it helps to improve your cognitive function and memory. And think about this, we, we kind of know this on a fundamental level, that high stress levels impair your cognitive function. So if you can reduce stress, you can bring oxygen to the brain, now you're boosting your ability to think, make decisions, plannings, things, planning, and things like that. Brain scans have shown that yoga increases the size of the hippocampus. This is the part of the brain that is responsible for processing information and it typically gets smaller with age. It's the first structure in the brain to be affected by dementia and Alzheimer's. Researchers also found in yogic practitioners that the prefrontal cortex is larger. This area is responsible for multitasking, planning, and decision making. Longtime yoga practitioners will tell you that they often work out their problems on the mat. Okay, and finally, this is the big one, okay? Hopefully you've stayed around for the whole video to see the number 11 reason, which is huge, which is the spiritual. And this one's subjective, okay? And it's very interesting to me because it can only be measured by a person's perception or their belief, okay? We can't measure the spiritual. So I'm just gonna be very concise about this. Every person that I know that have practiced yoga for a period of time have undergone some sort of spiritual transformation. And that's kind of a big buzzword, but really what's happened is they've become more in tune with themselves, more in tune with their physical body, which is their instrument of perception. And when they start to clear out their perception, right, when they get rid of um, some of the belief systems that they had about themselves or about others, and they get this a more clearer picture, they start to have a deeper connection with themselves, with their soul, in a sense. And when they have that deeper connection with the soul, they feel more connected to source or God or spirit or whatever you want to call it. And so it takes this first step of working on the physical, the energetic, the emotional, the intellectual, and working through all of these things that they get to the spiritual. And that's really where the magic happens. That's what it's all about. And that's just a natural byproduct of the practice. So to me, it just makes sense that if once you start to take care of your body and then you start to feel a closer connection with your soul, your spirit, and then the larger connection with the big soul or spirit or whatever you wanna call it, it just happens. And it's not something you plan, it's not something you can try to do, it just happens, it's a byproduct. And most people, when they get to this place, find a sense of peace. They find a sense of equanimity towards things and they just start to feel a little bit more joyful about life in general. So that's my take on what yoga is good for. There's so many aspects to it. I just really glossed over what I've seen are the major ones with me in my life and with the yoga students I've worked with over the past several years. So thank you very much. If you like what I'm saying, please hit the like button below, subscribe to my channel. I'll see you on the next video.